it may surprise you to know that Sleepy Hollow was never actually intended to be a Tim Burton movie. It was conceived in the early 90s by Kevin Yeager, a makeup effects designer on Tales from the Crypt, who wanted to write and direct a feature film adaptation from the short story The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. He met with screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker, best known for writing Seven and script doctoring movies like Fight Club, The Game, and a little movie we'll come to next week, and they pitched the movie to several producers, eventually landing in the hands of Scott Rudin. The original treatment of the film was supposed to be a pretentious slasher film with a spectacular death every five minutes, according to Jaeger, which sounds like a cynical Hollywood executive decision, but would you guess it, when Paramount picked up the project, they actually disagreed with Jaeger's concept and saw this classic literary adaptation as something akin to The Crucible, according to the film's other producer, Adam Schroeder. As a result, Jaeger was demoted to prosthetic makeup designer, and after years of development hell, interest was revived by Paramount CEO, and Tim Burton was hired to direct the film after leaving the chaos that was supposed to be Superman Lives. I like to think of Sleepy Hollow as Paramount's attempt to redeem themselves for destroying this horror movie the year before by putting it in the hands of a growing and well-respected filmmaker. At this point in the 90s, making a horror movie was a bit of a risk considering the slasher craze had ironically killed most of the genre while Scream tried to resuscitate it. So in Burton's hands, Sleepy Hollow sought to balance both a traditional period piece and expressionistic horror while still appearing close to Jaeger's original concept. I think the truth is that Burton was the only person truly suited to the job as he was able to draw heavy inspiration from later generation Hammer film productions like Frankenstein, Dr. Jackal, and Dracula to find the look that differed greatly from other horror movies of the 90s. I mean, they even got Michael Goth and Christopher Lee to star in the film who were already veterans to the genre, so I don't need to sit here and point out the obvious homage this film is to classical and gothic cinema, including that of the giallo genre, which was a style popularised by Italian filmmaker Mario Brava that combined mystery thrillers with subgenres in horror, hence the police procedural structure of the film which was akin to Agatha Christie novels, so to speak. Interesting. In fact, Burton and his cinematographer Emmanuel Lebesky originally envisioned the movie to look like this, but eventually opted for a high contrast monochrome style that perpetuated the American colonial lifestyle, architecture, and somewhat diseased look of the setting. It's definitely one of the most densely atmospheric films I've ever seen, to the point that the atmosphere literally has a mind of its own. The visuals say everything you need to know about this world. It's isolating, oppressive, and downright depressing. Yet all this grim morbidity is somewhat complemented with gallows humour. It isn't so much funny, but there is a campy tongue-in-cheek quality indicative of low-budget Hammer films. <laughs> It even goes as far as to acknowledge the bizarre lifestyles and behaviours of 18th century society, such as casually downplaying police brutality and corruption because people have become disinterested and accustomed to disorder and unjust punishment anyway, which is a recurring theme throughout the film. As a result, I think a lot of people will describe the film as silly dumb fun, but that seems to completely miss the fact that its self-aware style doesn't dismiss the harsh violence and dire circumstances. I don't know about you, but seeing a kid witness his own mother get decapitated before falling victim to the same fate to be a bit fucking bleak. Now, for the five Washington Irving purists out there who think that this movie butchers the original story, I like to think of this more as a reassembling to tell a much richer, darker, and admittedly more compelling tale. All the characters from the short story are repurposed with new relevance in the film. In the original, instead of being a police constable, Ichabod Crane was a schoolmaster trying to win the hand of Katrina, the daughter to a wealthy farmer. He then runs into conflict with Brom over Katrina, and because of his glaring superstition in witchcraft, Brom is able to scare Ichabod off using the legend of the Headless Horseman. Because once Ichabod encounters said horseman, he is never heard from again. The story then ends with rumours suggesting that Ichabod was taken away by the horseman, but really, it's greatly implied that Brom was the horseman in disguise. In the film, it's a bit more complicated than that, but let's start with Ichabod himself. In both stories, he's kind of a dick. I wouldn't necessarily call him selfish, but I would say he lacks empathy for other people, considering how socially inept he is in comparison to Irving's version. Since he's now going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the horseman, his bumbling cowardice is supposed to subvert the traditional expectations for a hero. Because in any other period piece, Brom would be the confident, charming hero, except in this world, that charm and confidence eventually get you killed. 
The major distinction is having Ichabod haunted by visions of his childhood where he found his mother dead inside an Iron Maiden after his father accused her of witchcraft. It's not greatly expanded upon, despite being arguably the most haunting part of the story, but nonetheless it adds a fitting context to both his character and the time period, where religious superstition still held a distinctly prominent fear over society, accentuated by the horseman essentially being a demon from hell as opposed to just some mythical ghost. It's thankfully not one of those exhausting I don't believe you narratives where they have to prove the existence of the supernatural. Once Ichabod witnesses the horseman himself, he thinks nobody will believe him, but yeah. In line with the gallows humor of the story, everybody shrugs it off as an ordinary encounter. It was a headless horseman. You must not excite yourself. But it was a headless horseman. Of course it was, that's why you're here. No, you must believe me. It was a horseman, a dead one. Headless. I know, I know. You don't know because you were not there. It's all true. Well, of course it is. I told you. Everyone told you. I saw him. And I love the tone the film takes with this. The existence of hell is just a commonplace acceptance where the townsfolk know their fate and can't escape it. I mean, they could just pack up and leave, but there's just something so encompassing about the forest that the townsfolk seem to surround themselves by the idea that God deliberately put them into this seemingly awaited purgatory until they meet their inevitable doom. There is sanctuary found in the church, but that doesn't stop evil from finding a way in. And the fact that so many characters are immediately doom from the start anyway creates a genuine sense of hopelessness and urgency that's only compounded by the fact that you're not entirely confident in this jackass's ability to save the day. But the real strength of the story is that the horseman isn't just some looming random killer murdering people just because. There's a well-established motive to who he targets, being the people who dug up his grave and stole his head, yet what really sells the dynamic of the conflict is the reveal that a witch is actually controlling him for her own vengeful scheme, thus further fitting into the supernatural aspects of the time period which I covered in my video on Robert Eggers' The Vivitch. That's how you pronounce that, right? Obviously, I'm not going to explain the plot because you could just watch the movie, but instead of there being a witch for the sake of it or to pad out the story, it very cleverly benefits the climax by connecting two plotlines together with a somewhat misdirection that's relevant to the murder mystery vibe that the story is going for. With Ichabod and the townspeople's attention turned to the horseman, the witch is able to covertly seek vengeance on those associated with the estate of a wealthy farm owner who screwed her family out of their ancestral home, leading to the death of her mother after they were banished to the woods due to rumours of the mother being involved in witchcraft. On the horseman's subplot, the witch is trying to prevent him from getting the head because once he gets it, it ends the curse that she created and he proceeds to take her back to hell, thus concluding the deal she made with the devil. I'll be blunt by saying that this is the best material the Headless Horseman was ever going to get. Kind of like what I said about Burton's style at the start of the video, this is the type of storytelling that is perfectly built for him because there really isn't anything to the Horseman mythology bar the very idea and visual it presents. You could argue that Walker's screenplay is conceptually overwritten, purely because it gives more credit to the original folklore and Irving story than it probably deserves. The Headless Horseman was never anything more than what today's internet culture would consider a typical creepypasta. It was never defined to specific details and instead varies from culture to culture. I know that in Ireland he was basically an evil fairy with a human spine for a whip, but pretty much every Irish horror myth involves evil fairies because they're the bane of our existence. Anyway, my general point is that Burton, Walker, and Jaeger deserve praise for at least making this a more compelling plot where Ichabod isn't the sole centre of attention like Irving's story. Given how simple and traditional it is, the only issue I have with the story, bar the lack of attention given to Ichabod's past, is the horseman's unremarkable backstory. Sure, the sharpened teeth and the use of Christopher Walken are cool, but I didn't sense anything tragic or complex about it, which I feel lessens the impact of what he could have had as the pawn to a witch's revenge. Given both Ichabod and the witch have similar tragedies surrounding their dead mothers related to witchcraft, I can't help but feel that the horseman is a missing link to give that motif more emotional resonance. But I'll compromise on the fact that the original American lore was simply that the horseman was a Hessian artilleryman who got his head shot off by a cannon during the Battle of White Plains in 1776, so I guess you could say they were trying to include some original details. To simply summarize, 
Sleepy Hollow just works as this self-contained horror fantasy that might not be especially scary or suspenseful, but it fundamentally understands how to get you in the mood for Halloween, thanks to a creative, enticing and passionate vision for how an urban legend as mysterious as this one should be presented. Who's with me? Me? Hey everyone, my voice is just gone as I finished this video. Uh, let me know what you think of Sleepy Hollow in the comments below, and over on Twitter, let me know your favourite Tim Burton film, because who knows, I might talk about Sweeney Todd or Mars Attacks in the future. Oh, the world's your oyster. Um, if you want to support the show, get early access, vote on future videos, obviously we're talking about Event Horizon next week, uh, you can do so by supporting the show on uh, Patreon. And yeah, stay safe, and I'll see you all very soon. Bye.